Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is February 29th, 2024. This video is called Why Mike Bickle Cannot Be Restored to the Ministry. About two months ago, a woman who lives in South Africa by the name of Christine Beatsworth received a prophetic word where God said to her, at Easter, and she believes he was talking about Easter 2024, which is just one month away. The Lord said to her, at Easter, the idol church will be swept to destruction. She has spelled idol two ways. One is I-D-L-E, mean, meaning doing nothing. Another way she spells it is I-D-O-L, that means filled with idolatry. I think both are applicable. At Easter, the idol church will be swept to destruction. But the watching ones will see and understand what is coming and warn and be led to safety. I think that she's talking here about the watching ones, of which I believe I am one. I do understand what is coming. I am warning, and I am warning so that you will be led to safety. This is, of course, a very hard word, why Mike Bickle cannot be restored to the ministry, but it's a word necessary because I've been watching what other ministers in the church have been saying, and they do not understand the gravity of what Mike Bickle is and what Mike Bickle did. They still think that this, this thing called IHOP or Forerunner Church can be saved, can be salvaged. But let me say to you, it is utterly corrupt because their leader and their founder is utterly corrupt. I want to read to you now a couple of visions that the prophet Kenneth Vischer saw years ago. First vision is this. Oh, by the way, this is in his writing called Facets of the Glorified Body, Part 7, For the Lord Our God is Holy, Addendum Number 7. And uh, I beheld then, laying upon the soil of the earth, the dead body of the false man-child. This dead body had just been birthed. It was yet covered in the water and the blood of birthing. The child was to have been of a fair complexion, but instead the skin of it was black with mold and fungus and rotting with gaping holes. The spine of it was twisted in such a manner that there was no straightness to the lifeless body. The eyes remained closed, the lips parched, even though the rest of the body still had wetness on it from just being born. The legs and arms were still in a fetal position, but were mangled and twisted and completely unusable. I knew this to be the judgment of God upon that which was false in the religious systems of men. The thing that amazed me, however, about seeing this dead infant lay upon the ground was that its parched mouth yet spoke. Every once in a while, it would speak forth syllables and partial sentences in an audible tone. However, all the words were blasphemy and all the quotes were meant to tear apart the person of the Lord as relates to him forming the true company of the man-child. So then the dead infant spoke defiantly and at will, even though there was no life within it. The carcass and mouth of this infant could only speak blasphemous words and nothing it said had anything to do with the life of the Lord in restoring this creation. I took this to mean that the religious systems of men had failed and had become a dead thing in the sight of the Lord. But it still spoke its blasphemy out into the atmosphere of the air, thus bringing its filth into the world even though God had determined it to be dead. I wondered greatly at this mystery. Ken Vischer is talking about the same thing that Christine Beadsworth is talking about when God gave her the word that at Easter, 
the idle church will be swept to destruction. This false man-child that Ken Vischer saw in a vision is really describing Mike Bickle. And it's describing every one of the false ministers. You know, many people, many of these false ministers have called out saying that the man-child is about to be birthed. But no one could have dreamed that all of these people were birthing a false man-child. This description of the false man-child. The child was to have been of a fair complexion, but instead the skin of it was black with mold and fungus and rotting with gaping holes. But yet it still spoke. It still spoke. The thing that amazed me, however, about seeing this dead infant lay upon the ground was that its parched mouth yet spoke. There are countless false Christs and false prophets in the world today. I'm not only talking about Mike Bickle. I'm talking about the many people out there who go by the name of prophet, apostle, preacher of great mysteries, preachers who talk about going to heaven and bringing Christ back down to us. There are two Christs. There is the true Christ, Jesus, who lives inside of me. And test yourself. Does the true Jesus live inside of you? Or is it a false Jesus, a false Christ that has been created by false prophecies like this false man-child utters? Ken said, every once in a while, it would speak forth syllables and partial sentences in an audible tone. However, all the words were blasphemy, and all the quotes were meant to tear apart the person of the Lord as relates to him forming the true company of the man-child. This false man-child's goal is to destroy the true believer and to try to prevent the true man-child from being born. And Ken says, So then, the child and the dead infant spoke defiantly and at will, even though there was no life within it. The carcass and mouth of this infant could only speak blasphemous words, and nothing it said had anything to do with the life of the Lord in restoring this creation. God will draw all men to himself, but the church preaches blasphemy in that it says that God will destroy most men, most men, but it will save corrupt people like Mike Bickle. Well, will the Lord save even Mike Bickle? I believe the answer is yes, but not when he thinks. Then Ken ended his vision like this. I took this to mean that the religious systems of men had failed and had become a dead thing in the sight of the Lord. But it still spoke its blasphemy. So this false man-child still spoke its blasphemy, even after the religious systems of men had failed spoke it out into the atmosphere of the air, thus bringing its filth into the world, even though God had determined it to be dead. I wondered greatly at this mystery. Well, these churches are still functioning, aren't they? They're still trying to get people to come to IHOP. Evidently, Forerunner Church is still running. And yet, those who lead these ministries, so-called, have not discerned 
the false man-child in their midst. They have not discerned the utter corruption of their leader, Mike Bickle. And again, it, it refers to so much more than just Mike Bickle. And it refers to many people who are happy and satisfied to sit under the teaching of false and corrupt leadership. Okay, moving on to the second vision that Ken Vischer saw. I saw the true Jesus, the one truly raised from the dead, disclosing with his voice his will into the ears of they that overcame. This disclosing from the true Jesus was not frequent, but rare. However, the words he spoke were enough to bring the footsteps of the overcoming company into perfect alignment with his perfect will for this very hour the hour we live in right now. As the true Jesus spoke, he did so by whispering with a very quiet voice his words into the ears of the listeners. It was then that they knew what steps to take in order to be ready for the coming of Christ to rule over the world of men. However, at the very same time in the denominational systems and in the world of religious men, the false Jesus would speak in the same manner into the ears of those who were deluded by him. The interesting thing was that the false Jesus would watch the true Jesus as he went about speaking into the ears of the overcomers. As soon as the true Jesus spoke into the ears of the overcomers, the false Jesus would speak into the ears of the deluded non-overcomers words to contradict, persecute, and refute the true Jesus's very words and will of the Lord. With every motion of the true Jesus speaking, there was an equal motion of the false Jesus speaking. With every bit of the will of God expressed through the mouth of the true Savior, that which contradicted the will of God was spoken through the mouth of the false Savior. There were two definite results of the true and the false Jesus speaking. To those few of humanity who heard the true Jesus speaking, they obtained and remained in the status of those who the Lord would mark as overcomers. The one who the false Jesus had an open ear to and who sat and thought they were listening to the true Jesus when in fact they were not, were not counted as overcomers and were rejected. The motion of the Holy Spirit in them was not present. There is a true Jesus and a false Jesus, a true father and a false father, a true Holy Spirit and a false Holy Spirit. There is true fruit and false fruit. In this case, the false Jesus made it possible for the false father and the false spirit to manifest and work in the lives of they that did not overcome, thus bearing false fruit. I knew that this was the abomination that makes desolate standing in the holy place as God, saying, I am God, and it was not God. These who listened to the false Jesus persecuted they who listened to the true Jesus, rejecting them and casting them out of their fellowships and assemblies and not giving them any room or place in their gatherings, even though the true overcomers did not want to be in false gatherings. So it was that God used this to finally separate completely the true overcomer from those who are not overcoming. <clears throat> end of second vision. Uh, he had three visions, though, in this writing, so I'm going to read the third one. Standing then upon the paved work before the throne, I saw Jesus, glorified and arrayed in the garments of the great King of Kings, but also in the garments of one whom the Father had accepted as the chief Melchizedek of all the priests of God. Christ stood there with the marks of the cross upon him, but also with the high office of the heavenly intercessor, interceding on behalf of humanity. That's Melchizedek. His eyes were as flames of fire, and his hair white like wool, covered in the bright eternal light of heavenly glory, and his garment shone brighter than the sun in glory. He spoke unto the Father, and the Father who was seated upon the throne slowly rose to his feet. As he did, I saw in front of him the world of men in this present hour. There was a set time where the systems of men all came up before the Father while this intercession was taking place. As God rose up to his feet, 
all the systems of men collapse the whole world over in the space of one literal hour. All the economies of man, all the politics of man, all the dominions and monarchies of men, all of them collapsed as though a wall were broken down and fallen in the midst of a city creating a great dust storm. As this collapse happened, I knew that this was in fact the mercy of God and everlasting love towards this humanity that he had created. This humanity right now that we live in. It was mercy that ended man's systems in but one hour so that there would not be a prolonged and unmerciful dealing of God leaving man stranded without any directive. The entire collapse was necessary for God to bring in his pure and holy dominion and to bring about his perfect will in the earth in the age wherein Christ descends to establish and rule over all the nations in this age that is dawning. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. End of the third vision. Now this third vision is dealing with the destruction of Babylon the Great. I've taught a lot about that, and you can go to my past videos to understand it. This is talking about the destruction of Babylon the Great. In chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, it says four times, in one hour, all of this was destroyed. All the merchants of the earth are crying and weeping and throwing dust in the air. In one hour, all of their wealth is destroyed. Merciful, yes. We see what they're doing. They are planning our total destruction, but God will act before they can move to their final play. And that's what this third vision is talking about. The second vision is dealing with <clears throat> both the true Christ and the false Christ. I have read this as well as the first vision, which was of the false man-child, because Mike Bickle, IHOP, Forerunner Church, and all the others out there that are false, and that is most of them, are producing, have produced, and are producing a false man-child, and they also worship a false Jesus. That false Jesus has become the abomination of desolation within their own hearts. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. Do you understand? The holy place is your heart. I hope that if you don't understand that yet, you will by the time I finish explaining why Mike Bickle can never be restored to ministry. It has now been almost five months since some of Mike Bickle's sins were first exposed to the world. Now we know that Mike Bickle's entire ministry included praying sexually upon young women who came under the power of his corrupted spirit and perverted views of Jesus, the Christ. Many Christian leaders wonder if Mike can be restored to ministry. I don't. I know he can never be restored. Not in this age, which is about to end, nor in the next age, which is about to begin. Mike Bickle has blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And even worse, he has subjected Christ to a second crucifixion, which can never and will never happen. Now we're going to read scriptures now. Speaking of which, <clears throat> my wife reminded me that about the last time we attended Metro Vineyard Fellowship in 1993, Mike preached. And when he preached, he preached a passage of scripture and he left out the most important verse in it and then 
preached something that was totally contrary to the meaning, meaning of that scripture. That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit because it's lying about what the Holy Spirit said to whomever wrote that scripture down. We're going to start with Matthew 24, starting with verse 15, reading through 28. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. The holy place is here in our heart. The abomination of desolation has now been seen standing in the holy place of men's hearts, men who have led ministries around the world. When you see that, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. The, mountain, the mountains are the overcomers of God. Those in Judea are those who truly are Jews, those who proclaim Jesus, the King of the Jews, as King of kings and Lord of lords. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, speaking of ministries, all these things are speaking of ministries. Don't be concerned with your ministry. You've been involved with false ministry all your life. It's time now for the kingdom to come and many of you are not ready. Don't go to try to take anything with you because what you have is not valuable for what is coming. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. In other words, just do it. Get it done. Get out of where you are that is steeped in the false Jesus, the false man-child. Get out of there. Flee to the mountains. Find the mountains of God and learn the truth. Get your oil. Get your oil that you need for what's coming. Verse 21, for then there will be great tribulation. Okay, we are in the midst of tribulation now. They have planned things that are far worse for us. The tribulation, I think, will get worse before it gets better. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. So these are the worst days ever. And that's really what Ken Vischer prophesied in that prophecy concerning what God was going to take from behind his hand and release to the world. He prophesied the, the COVID-19 planned pandemic way back in, in around 2011. Verse 22, and if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Okay, this is the time we're living in right now. So then, that means right now, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. You should listen to the last two or three of the Job videos I did. I talk about this quite a bit. In Romans chapter 10, it talks about the righteousness that comes by faith. And Paul says this, The righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. The righteousness based on faith says, Do not say, Who will descend into the abyss, into hell? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The righteousness based on faith says, The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, test yourself. 
Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Examine yourselves. Verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Have you ever tested yourself? Does Jesus Christ live within you? How do you know? Well, what's the fruit of your life? What's the fruit of your life? Are you one of the women that was easily deceived by Mike Bickle and were seduced by him? Well, then you probably fail the test. Or at least you failed the test then because you were not following the spirit of Jesus. You were following the false Jesus who said to you that sex with this person who represented the false Jesus was okay. Now, how did, how did you fall for that? How could you have fallen for that? Because you did not know the words of the true Jesus. You did not know the fruit of of the true Jesus. The fruit of the true Jesus would never ever do that to you. Only a false Jesus, only a false Christ would seduce a young woman. Understand when you're young you don't know a lot, but you knew do not commit adultery and you knew that was adultery. So you are without excuse as well. Bickle sinned, you sinned. You have to repent. Ministers and leaders that were with Mike Bickle for a long time, you have to repent as well. <clears throat> so in Matthew 24... When Jesus says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, what they're doing is what Paul said that we cannot do. In Romans chapter 10, he said, The righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. In other words, don't go over there to get Christ to bring him to where you are. Or the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say who will descend into the abyss. And no, don't go there either. <clears throat> you don't need to go looking for Christ because the word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Jesus Christ lives within us if we have believed in him. If we have truly believed in him, we receive the earnest of the Holy Spirit. We can test ourselves and know that we're hearing the word of truth because our life will begin to produce the fruit of righteousness. But if you have no fruit of righteousness, if you instead are committing adultery <clears throat> with the leader of your church, you fail the test. If you're the leader of the church and you are seducing women or men, Christ is not in you. You fail the test. Now, Jude, the, the book of Jude, one chapter, and Second Peter chapter 2, the whole chapter of chapter 2, both speak of people like Mike Bickle and these others, other pastors and so-called prophets. Jude, verse 4, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for condemnation, ungodly people, who pervert the grace of our God into sensu sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Now, I want to remind you, although you once knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. This is talking about the time um, 
just before the flood of Noah, the angels who came and had sexual intercourse with women who produced giants in the earth. He is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. That word eternal is age-lasting fire. <clears throat> I want to read a little bit <clears throat> from Second Peter 2. Speaking of these same men that Jude was talking about, he starts here. Chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. So they deny Christ. They don't say they deny Christ. They say they're Christians. They say they believe in Jesus, but they believe in a false Jesus. They deny Jesus, the true Jesus, by contradicting him, by telling these women that sex with them is okay. It's not okay. Over and over in the scripture, we're taught that it's not okay. Old Testament, New Testament. <clears throat> so they deny the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Then I'm going to go down to verse 9 and read on from there. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Mike is one of the unrighteous, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Well, that describes him, doesn't it? Bold and willful, bold, saying particular prophecies in order to seduce people. Bold and willful, they do not tremble, tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power than they are, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord, but these, these men, these men who have the false Christ within them, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. You saw pictures of Mike's double locked office at IHOP. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. These women, they were young, they were unsteady. They should have had a leader they could trust. And they should have had their own discernment. They should have read their Bibles. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Balaam is the classic false prophet, truly heard from God, but corrupted his gift. Balaam was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrain that prophet's madness. These men are waterless springs. These men like Mike Bickle and others, leaders under Mike who did not discern what Mike was, who he was. These are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person to that, he is enslaved. Slaves to sin. 
For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that's what they said they had done. If they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Concerning men like this, Jesus said this, and that was after the Pharisees accused him of, of casting out demons by, the, by Satan. Verse 30 of Matthew 12, Jesus says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. When Mike Bickle said that he had certain prophecies, that he had heard certain things, that God had told him certain things, and he used that to seduce women, what did he do? He spoke against the Holy Spirit. He called good evil and evil good. He used the name of the Lord in vain in order to do evil. He blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Jesus says he will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. This age has been the church age and is now ending. The next stage is the millennium when the overcomers are going to bring the people alive then into the kingdom, into New Jerusalem. Mike will not be forgiven then either. He will not be resurrected until the second resurrection at the end of the millennium. And then Jesus goes to this. Verse 33 of Matthew 12. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Bickle is condemned by his words. He's condemned by a life characterized by bad fruit and blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He cannot be restored to ministry because he is corrupt. He cannot be trusted. He cannot be trusted ever in this age or the age to come. In Luke chapter 13, very important verse with respect to understanding these things, starting in verse 22. Jesus went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And Jesus said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, the Lord, the master of the house. I don't know you. I don't know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence. We were up all night singing praise and worship and praying for the world. We went to IHOP. We sacrificed all night, night after night. We fasted. Lord, open to us, and he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. 
Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. We went to IHOP and you taught in our streets. But he'll say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God but you yourselves cast out. Because you did not discern the truth, you followed a false Christ, you followed a false prophet, you went here and there looking for prophets. Big event theology, that was what I coined back in 92 or 3, just before I left Metro. Big event theology, boy, it was all about going to the big events, hearing what the master prophet had to say. It was all deception. People will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Why can Mike Bickle never be restored to ministry? Because he would be crucifying Christ a second time. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm, and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God, so they produced good fruit. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless, produced bad fruit, and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. It has its part in the lake of fire. And I've taught about that too. It's not what people think it is. It's not an everlasting torment in actual flames of fire. It's the application of the rod of iron, the word of God, through his glorified overcomers. Then to fully understand this passage from Hebrews 6, we go to Hebrews 10. Verse 26, just following right on the heels. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. You crucify Christ a second time, so there is no sacrifice. If you believe that you can go on sinning because you believed in Jesus, you have believed in a false Jesus, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins because you would be sacrificing Christ the true Christ, a second time. Instead, there's a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Isn't that what Bickle did? Trampled underfoot the Son of God by using the name of God to seduce women and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Can you think of anyone who was punished for sacrificing Christ a second time? He's mentioned in this last passage, verse 27 of Hebrews 10, Moses, Moses struck the rock twice. And for that, God said, because you did not believe in me, because you had, had no faith, you cannot go into the promised land. You have to die. That was a type. It was, a, it was showing us prophetically what crucifying Christ a second time means. It means you don't get in. You don't get into the promised land when you should have. Ultimately, you're going to come in, but 
not right away. And Moses was denied entrance because of that act. Now it was it was a prophetic picture. It was a parable showing us a prophetic spiritual truth. Moses is an overcomer, one of the highest, one of the highest of all. So he is there, but he showed us what happens to those who crucify Christ a second time. The reason why people fell into this sin, both the ministers that ministered under Mike and the people who were seduced by Mike, is because they had idols in their own heart. Idols of being great. Uh, the ministers, oh man, I'm, I, I'm one of the men who has direct access to Mike Bickle. One of the women. I'm one of the women that has direct access to Mike Bickle. Okay. Ezekiel 14. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Any one of the house of Israel, the house of Israel speaks of the church. Ezekiel was in Babylon. He had been captured from Jerusalem and taken there prisoner. Israel itself had been destroyed and taken out of the land over 120 years before this. He's not talking to Judah. He's talking to the house of Israel that prophetically, according to the book of Hosea and according to Paul in Romans 9 through 11, is the house of Israel is the church. Thus says the Lord God, therefore say to the house of Israel, therefore say to the church, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Don't you see the abominations committed at IHOP? For any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel who separates himself from me taking his idols into his heart and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. So many people went to Metro and Forerunner Church and IHOP for words of the Lord. And I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people and you shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord set his face against Mike. Mike Bickle is now a sign and a byword and has been cut off from the midst of his people. And if the prophet himself is deceived and speaks the word, then I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand against him and I will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. You false prophets, you better shut up because this judgment is coming. Listen. And they shall bear their punishment. The punishment of the prophet and the punishment of the inquirer shall be alike. That the house of Israel may no more go astray from me nor defile themselves any more with all their transgressions but that they may be my people and I may be their God, declares the Lord God. There is hope. As long as we repent, there is hope. But there is no hope for Mike Bickle to be restored to ministry because that would be to crucify Christ a second time. He has forfeit that. And I believe there's a lot of others who have forfeit that. And you ministers who ministered under Mike Bickle, soberly consider this. You need to understand how deep, how great his fall is. 
and has been for a long time. And you need to speak the truth to the people who believed you. You have a heavy weight upon your shoulders.